It is great to be together this Sunday morning, and uh, because we've got a little fuller of a house today, I say we turn to our neighbor and just say a safe hello. Uh, Maybe you've already said hello. Say hello again. Good to see you. If you haven't introduced yourself, make sure you know each other's name. You can give a, a hi. Okay, there you go. All right, now we're friendly. Okay, here we go. Uh, we, uh, we are starting a, a brand new series today, studying out the book of John. And so to open that up, there's a short video, and then uh, we'll jump right into things. go. The Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. Someone said I just chose that for personal reasons. My name is John, but no, this John far preceded me. John is the Gospel of Love, and we're calling this series A Greater Love from John 15. Uh, But the word love appears in the Gospel about 40 times, usually this word agape, which we've talked about many times. And John is uh, one of those books that If you've been around church for a while, you are very familiar with it, or you've even got some of the passages memorized. You see John 3.16, even at football games, uh, John 13.34, love as I have loved, uh, and maybe even some less familiar love passages like what we talked about on Wednesday night at our Zoom midweek service about Jesus loving us to the end. Um, But of course, this passage up here in John 15 where our title comes from, is just an astounding verse. Let's read it together. It says, No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You know, I think it's, uh, we were talking about it earlier. Thank you, Sean and Bianca. It's, It's a pretty big understatement to say that these last two years in this global pandemic has changed our lives forever. I mean, that's an understatement. It's significantly changed our lives. It's a marker in history. We still don't know what the future holds and how we're how we're gonna imagine what life is going to be like in a month from now or even a year from now. And the loss we've experienced is pretty tremendous uh, from loved ones to personal freedoms to distances in our relationship. So as people of faith, one of the things we do when we come together for church on Sunday is we look to the sacred text. We look to the Bible to find hope when in a lot of our world, there is hopelessness, right? We find faith when there's darkness. And it's good to know, and it's an important reminder to know, that God's plan still works, all right? Uh, Just because there is a pandemic, there's not a footnote that says under the Bible in the verses, hey, if there's a global pandemic, stop doing this, all right? It still works. It's still principally true, universally, and morally true, true. Jesus is still the way, the truth, and the life. And the answer that a lot of us are, the question we're we're asking is, what now, all right? And the answer is still in Jesus. It's in his word. And what's interesting about the book of John is that this is the kind of book that we recommend to people that are just being introduced to the faith. It's also a book that those who've been around for a long time are still digging deeply into. So it's got something for everybody. It's 21 chapters, and we're going to take 21 weeks to get through this book. We're not going to be able to cover everything on Sunday, little snippets. So it's important that as you dive in, that this is a collaborative effort, right? 
that we're not coming to church on Sunday to be entertained or just to be fed information. This is an interactive sport, right? We are all in this. We're all digging in. This is our church, not mine, not yours, right? And so I encourage you throughout the week to be looking at the book of John, reading it on your own when you can, uh, putting little verses in your phone or little reminders so that we can all grow through this book together. There's a couple of resources I'll recommend. Of course, there's so many, too many, uh, but these are a few that I've been using, and uh, you know, this will be online if you want to look at it later, but the Bible Project, many of you are familiar with it. They have some incredible videos about the book of John, including one specifically on John chapter 1. Just YouTube it. Uh, there's a great book by Carter and Redberg uh, about looking at Jesus throughout all of the scriptures, Old and New Testament, uh, this one particularly about John. And then Bruce and Carson are two of my favorites. That's the little deeper dive. You get the languages, the history, and the context. Let's talk a little bit about John as a book. Typically what you'll see if you look at a commentary are these four things and a few others. What's the literary genre? Who wrote it? What date was it written? What's the occasion or what's the reason it was written? So the genre is narrative, another way of saying a story. Um, and actually the other three gospels, they've got dozens of stories compared to this one. John's only got seven. They zero in in more of the qualitative interactions that Jesus has personally with people as opposed to the quantity of interactions he has. There are a lot of metaphors in this book. Earth, water, bread, blindness, water. There's a fascinating article I read that uh, the title is The Gospel of John and the Five Senses. Really cool article by Dorothy Lee. And it's a universal gospel, something for everyone. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. So it's, it's a narrative. The author, there is some debate about this. It's like, well, why do you call it the book of John if John didn't write it? Yeah, I, I think we're on good ground here, but there's another guy named John in history that some scholars want to say maybe he wrote it. Some people even talk about how the community around John might append it after his death. Here's, here's my two cents on the issue. Um, whether John wrote it himself as an old man or whether some of his crew penned down his thoughts I believe God inspired these very personal words about Jesus and that these accounts were real eyewitness experiences. And there's a lot of history that we'll cover to explain more about that. So the author is John. The date. Anyone want to guess? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's also hotly debated. It's what you're going to see in history. It's not an exact science. It's a, it's a scholarly pursuit. Um, but it is the latest of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. were all written pretty early. Um, and so a lot of scholars put this maybe at 80 or 85 AD. For those of us who've been around for a little while, you've heard me talk about the big thing that happened in 70 AD, which was the destruction of Jerusalem, the sacking of Jerusalem by Rome, uh, then the destruction of the temple. That's a very big deal, and we're going to talk more about that as well, and there are reasons why scholars will put the date here a little later than that. The occasion, what I really want to get to here. Um, is there was a lot of issues going on in the church. And there was a reorientation that the church needed to go through in order to move forward after it had been through so much together. These new philosophies were confusing the church. Some distorted theology was getting in the church. There was a lot of diversity now. Before, you just have sort of one demographic of Jew who became a Christian. Now you've got Jew and Gentile, old and young. You've got kingdom kids. You've got uh, different cultures and races and geography. And the big thing is that at the beginning, after Jesus raised from the dead and left and said, I'm coming back, they were all waiting for him to come back any night. Like, okay, it's dinner time. Maybe he's coming. Okay, I'm going to go to sleep. It's hard for me to sleep. He might be coming. It's breakfast time. Maybe he's coming. And after a few years went by, they were like, I don't know if he's coming. And then they were like, well, he's coming. He just hasn't come yet. Thief in the night thing. You can't predict it. Even now, some people try to predict it, right? We don't know when that's going to happen. But the church had to reorient given that they're no longer running a sprint, but a marathon. Does that make sense? So it's kind of like us after two years of disorientation. Where's the church at? Where are we going? How am, where am I at spiritually? How does it all affect me? I think it's a very timely gospel for us. There's a stated purpose in John 20, here in verse 30 and 31. It says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. 
It's a really important word here, and I've highlighted it for you a couple times, this word pisteo. It's a Greek word that means uh, belief or believing. And here, the forms that you're going to see, which appears 97 times in the Gospel of John, is not the noun form, but the verb. In other words, when we're talking about being a believer, having faith, that's a, a noun What John does is he puts Jesus into a verb, a action, a relationship. Not a mechanism, not a thing you own, but a thing that you are over time. Does that make sense? It's really cool because it's not something that you just get one day. It's something that you develop. It's a relationship with Jesus. All right, I want to dive into three things in chapter one that I feel like are pretty important, not only to set the stage for the whole series, but also for just John chapter one. There's no way we can cover it all. I know there's going to be times that I get done and someone's going to go, oh, my favorite part you didn't get to. I am sorry in advance, okay? Uh, We can talk about you preaching uh, during the week and we can figure out a Zoom time. You can preach to me if you want. I'm happy to hear all that you have to say. Uh, This is a a hard task though to, to truncate what is just some amazing stuff in the Bible here uh, into just a few minutes. So Uh, We talked about issues in the church that John is addressing, and I want to talk about three of them here. And the first one is Greek philosophies. In John chapter 1, I'll read verse 1 through, uh, it's actually 1 through 5 here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Remind you of anything? Yeah, say it loud. Genesis chapter 1. Fantastic Bible scholars. You're like, wait, this sounds eerily familiar. Let me line it up for you. Read it right next to it. Genesis 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning, it even starts with the exact same thing. God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty and dark. It talks about let there be light, separated light from the darkness. This is very deliberate stuff that John is doing. So, okay, we understand that if you were a Jew, reading John's letter for the very first time, you would immediately say, oh, okay, I know what he's talking about. That's a reference to Genesis chapter one. But the topic here is Greek philosophies. Why does it matter for anyone who's not a Jew? What kind of red flags are being raised here? Well, I'll tell you what. It's all in the word logos. The word, word. We actually don't have a great translation. It could be reason. It could be word. It could be uh, rational thought. Uh, There's a lot of things it can mean. And the Stoic philosophers and Plato and these Greek philosophers were all about this word. This was their word 400 years before Jesus walked the earth. What did they think it meant? Well, for them, Logos was the universal force, all right? Any Jedi lovers in here? It's like that. That represented the rationality and intelligibility of the world. I don't have time to read the Carson quote here, but they believed Logos was like their God. They were religious about rational thought, about logic, about the soul's rational ability to discern life. So, If you were in the Greco-Roman world in the first century and you heard this guy, John, writing a letter about this Messiah and this Savior and he used the word logos, you say, hang on a minute. No, 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 no. Logos is our word. This is what we talk about on the philosopher's hill. Logic is our Lord. Who are you? You're saying a person? It has become logic, has become the word and the source? And John's like, yep, that's exactly what I'm saying. What is John's message? It's that Jesus is the Logos. He is the rational force that preceded the universe. It reminds us a little bit of Acts 17 and this idea of Paul speaking to the philosophers there and that all the philosophers were grasping for something greater to believe in, to understand divinity, but they missed the boat on the real thing. He's like, you're worshiping all these things, but really you should be worshiping this. This is no different than today. Do you know anyone that considers uh, rational thought their God? I mean, you don't have to think too far to say, oh, how do most people think, especially in New York? If it makes sense to them, that's what they're going to do, right? That, that's a way of being religious to their God, the Logos. And so what's going on here? 
this is actually quite a subversive text. What do I mean by that? John is challenging the way people thought about life and God. This is actually how I became a Christian. I worshiped logic. It's probably hard for you to imagine. Um, Even though I was a very passionate person, very emotional, I felt like emotions were less than. And you should never base any, you know, opinion on emotion because that's just, you know, your, your body lying to you. And I, I remember ending a relationship one time, and I had four reasons why we were ending this relationship. And I was so confused why she was crying at the very beginning. I was like, I haven't finished giving you the four reasons. <laughs> but I met my match when I met Jesus in the Bible. Because I was face to face. I know, horrible, right? Thank, thank God for grace and mercy. And I was studying the Bible. I'm like, what is, what is this Jesus, the Logos? You're saying that you know, he's the real reason, the, the way, truth, life? I don't get it. Explain it to me. And every time I would debate or ask a question, they would turn me another scripture about Jesus and his life. And I couldn't win. And that was sort of the whole point. As long as I was fighting God, I wasn't winning at life. I was losing. The religion of the rational world still lingers. But John reminds us of a greater love in the great Logos. We're just teasing your mind into the scriptures here. Point number two, distorted theologies. This is another thing that was going on in the early church. At this point, the church had been around for decades. Like any church, when you've been around for a little while, what happens? All kinds of craziness, right? Because we're a church filled with people, and people are sinners, and we make mistakes, we mess up, so stuff goes down, right? No different in the first century church. So false doctrines crept in, Gnosticism, uh, Docetism, Marianism. What is all this? Well, the main problem with these, reli- with these philosophies that turned into theologies were that they believed, and Christians started believing, that Jesus wasn't really human. Now, you can imagine kind of this younger generation, right, coming into the church, listening to the old fogies tell their stories about the old glory days, and Jesus healed this, and he raised from the dead, and they're like, did he really raise from the dead, though? I mean, if he did, then he can't really be human. He's just only divine. He was more of a ghost, an apparition, a celestial being that came down. And we believe that, but we don't believe he could really be in the flesh. You guys get the problem? So what does John write? In verse 14, the word became, (laughs) John doesn't mess around. He's like, he doesn't, he doesn't beat around the bush. He's like, okay, let me lay this out. And he made his dwelling among, among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace and in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So John gets right into it. He says, all you out there that are thinking that Jesus wasn't in the flesh, yes, he was, and here's why. And he purposely uses that same word that they use for a tent or a tabernacle. Why is he doing that? Well, it's another way of him saying that Jesus pitched his tent on the earth and became a conduit, a bridge between the Father and us, just like the tabernacle in the Old Testament. And he uses a word that sounds exactly like it. He's appealing to their shared history. In other words, John doesn't beat them over the head with truth without a whole lot of grace. Here's what's cool about grace and truth. That was another Hebrew red flag. Grace and truth, grace and truth. That sounds an awful lot like chesed and emet, the Old Testament, the Hebrew words for loving kindness or grace and emet, which is truth. So he's bringing in that old stuff again, the shared history. Remember when we used to talk about love and truth all the time, mercy and truth all the time. I'm bringing it back in Jesus. You know, the greatest theology that we have is love. According to several social health studies, divorces, relationship fallouts, roommate divisions, and friendships around the world have suffered during covid It's the pandemic deterioration of love. A Columbia University study of over 200,000 people across North America, Europe, and Asia found that depression and anxiety are at their highest levels. And they're linked with the deterioration of relationships and the distancing we've had to endure during the pandemic. 
And the World Health Organization says social distancing has actually depleted our brain's production of oxytocin, which is this bonding chemical that the body creates as we connect with one another. In other words, we're love anemic. Now, do we really need the Ivy League and government agencies to tell us that? And yet, here we are. It's our reality. And it's important to name the things that we suffer with so that we can figure out how to work through it together. What happens in relationships is that distance starts as sort of a neutral. It's like, oh yeah, we haven't had time or we don't talk or whatever. And then that becomes a silence and then that fades the friendship until it's gone. Couples might go to bed angry and they are not exercising those tools anymore or maybe haven't learned how to express, process, and resolve those issues. And so the pandemic adds an extra stress layer that none of us were prepared for. And the answer isn't beating each other over the heads with truth or your truth about whatever you think about the virus or the vaccine or politics or taxes or whatever. But the answer is love. Yes, honesty, but love, a greater love. Let me finish with this last one. The pagan deities were also a big issue. You're going to see this all over the book of John. It's a fascinating study. John is very specific about fighting against some stuff, some junk that has crept into the church. In chapter 118, it says, no one will ever, has ever seen God, but the one and only son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the father has made him known. Now, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. This is John the Baptist. He did not fail to confess, but confess freely, I am not the Messiah. People were so desperate to, to worship something, to lock into some anchor, that they looked at John the Baptist doing some stuff, and they're like, wait, you must be it. Are you it? And he's like, nope. And there was a lot of competition. Here's three. Here's three uh, of the competitors for divine status in the first century for the average Greco-Roman citizen. All right, you got Hermes. What was Hermes' title? The Good Shepherd. Sound familiar? Dionysus. Uh, he was the god of wine, among some other things. And then the Caesars, particularly starting with Augustus and all the way through Claudius, they were considered the savior of the world and son of God, Divifilius. Interesting. So guess what we're about to see in the pages of the Gospel of John? Jesus is the better Dionysius, right? Because he turns water into wine, right? He, he takes him out. Jesus is the better Hermes, who knows all the sheep by name. Jesus is the better Caesar, not saving the world by conquest, but by compassion. That is the greater love that we will be studying together. Amen? All right, that's just a little intro. I want to end uh, with this story about an amazing man, a hero, uh, that I think is appropriate to remember in relation to this study and particularly today. And his name was Arthur Ashe. If you don't know about Arthur Ashe, he won three Grand Slam single tennis titles. He was the first black player selected to the United States Davis Cup team and the only black man ever to win the singles title at Wimbledon, U.S. Open, and the Australian Open. Ash and uh, his family members, if you follow the genealogy, were actually owned by slave owners. And when they tracked it down, they actually found that there was a governor by the name of Samuel Ash in North Carolina. And that family owned the Ash family. The family ended up in Virginia, and young Ash picked up tennis in the local playground. And uh, it's interesting as he grew up. Uh, as a black man playing a very white sport. Uh, and when he would enter tournaments, most of them not integrated, but whenever he went to an integrated tournament, um, his coach gave him some advice. Because in tennis, it can be a matter of millimeters, whether the ball is in or out. And there are judges kneeling down and squinting. Now there's all this technology to figure out exactly where the ball hit. Uh, back then there wasn't that. And so when the, his coach was telling him how to how to deal with tennis when you're in an integrated tournament uh, playing against white players is that if the ball goes even two inches outside the line, which is clear in tennis terms, you still play the ball because the umpire will not rule in your favor. And it was those things that Ash grew up with and understanding how his race played into his life. In 1960, 
Ash was precluded from competing against white youths uh, in segregated Richmond during the school year. He was unable to use indoor courts, uh, and he was only able to play with other black players. One of the reasons he wasn't allowed is because he got really good. And yet, even with those restrictions, he would still find a way to win the national indoor title. And then December of 1960 was featured in Sports Illustrated. I want to show you a short clip from a recent documentary about his life, just to give you a little bit more idea of the context that he was in. The game of tennis is a symphony in white. Players in white suits hitting a white ball back and forth between white baselines in all white country clubs. But a new young player has come along, and he is one of the greatest we have ever produced, and he is not white. The documentary is amazing, by the way. I definitely recommend it. Ash would enter into a very white sport as a black man and do very well. He, at one point, was ranked number one in the world. And what I love about Ash, of the many things, is that he won with style and grace. One opponent had displayed some particular disrespect on the court, uh, and it was kind of no surprise because this guy, uh, Eli Nastasi, was notorious off the court. He would brag about his promiscuity. He was arrested twice. Both have to do with public drunkenness. Uh, and after the match, which Ash lost to uh, Nastasi, Ash got on the microphone in the post-match uh, interview and basically said, uh, this is a very tough opponent. And, you know, he's a pretty colorful player. That was the term he used. And then he said this verbatim. And when he brushes up on some of his court manners, he's going to be even better. He had to call a brother out for being rude. Now, during that time, Ash was approached by many civil rights leaders to use his platform to speak out against racism and civil rights abuses. But he had a hard time uh, doing that and committing to it and finding the reason in it. He joined the army for a little while. He was caught in this tension. And he was even called Uncle Tom during that time. Um, but he regretted it and eventually stepped up and started to speak up using his platform. And he moved to New York City. Uh, he lived here. He marched. He protested. He was arrested twice, similar to Nastasi, but not for foolishness. He spoke up for those who couldn't speak up for themselves. He fought against racism here uh, and in South Africa, apartheid, uh, on and off the court. He was relentless. Eventually, and unfortunately, he contracted HIV from a blood transfusion he received during a heart surgery in 1983, and then he died this day, February 6th, a decade after that, right here on the Upper East Side. He has written countless articles and books about blackness in America on and off the court, too many humanitarian awards to count, <clears throat> the Arthur Ashe Foundation to, for AIDS, Arthur Ashe Institute for Urban Health. He received the Presidential Medal of Freedom after his death. And I want to end this thought with a, a quote that he inscribed in a book once, which I think is very powerful. He quotes another person saying, we want to disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed. Ash reminds me of the Gospel of John. It's grace under fire. This gospel is written with that same passion and conviction, confronting the truth head on with love and honesty. But what I love about the gospel and what I love about Ash is that even as they stood up to the injustices, even as John wrote against the injustices, they both didn't lower themselves to the moral standards of what they were fighting against. They didn't fight fire with fire. Fought it with love. And love is harder. And Jesus died because of love. This is the spirit of Jesus' life, to bring love to a world that deeply craves it, especially now, even if it's hard for the world to admit it. As we go to the communion right now and remember Jesus' death and resurrection, let's be thinking about how John can transform our lives in the context that we're in right now and by the power of Jesus to disturb what's comfortable and comfort those of us who are disturbed. Let's bow our heads and pray. God in heaven, we are grateful to be able to embark on this journey, a book that many of us have read many times, 
But we hope and pray, and, and even already, uh, that you will open our eyes to new truths, or even old truths in new ways. Freshen our perspective and help us reorient our faith individually and as a church in the midst of this life-changing situation, this pandemic we've been in the last couple of years. God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he stood up to injustice. Thank you that he did it with love and was willing to put it all out there, a greater love where he sacrificed his very life. Thank you for men like Ash who remind us of that same spirit in the book of John that leads us to understanding, to understanding who you really were. Thank you that you are the word, the divine logos, alive in our lives right now as we open the scriptures. In this very moment, we realize you're with us. Thank you for the death and resurrection on the cross and for the power and the hope of new life spiritually on this earth and into the next. We love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.